Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Mother's Day to all your mamas out there. So it's a beautiful day here in uh, Southern Kentucky. Just thought I'd jump in here. It's it's early. You know, you guys rarely, rarely see a daytime stream or <clears throat> whatever. I decided to live stream this one. I'm recording it as well, but um, I decided to go ahead and live stream it. Um, if I don't like the live stream, I'll just make that private and then cut and edit the uh, recorded one. But yeah, other than that, like I said, beautiful day. It's probably around, let's see, I guess the live stream went live earlier today. It took like a while the last time, but I, I already see, see it live on my phone. It is 80 degrees. I guess the temperature has actually gone up as it's gone into the evening here. So bring that down a little bit. Looks like it's going to start dropping here around 8 o'clock, around sunset. and eh, Get down into the high 50s overnight. So maybe a little bit of rain a little bit later. Very small chance. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just going to say it right here up front. I'm very tired. I've been up uh, since 10 o'clock last night. I've been on sort of an odd schedule and like a work schedule with my, well, I can't call it a daytime thing. <laughs> my nighttime, my, my job. Um, you know, I, I stayed up, stay up a lot late at night to, to do um, IT type work, technical stuff. So I was up most of the night working on some projects and started to lay down this morning but then you know realized i wasn't super tired and you know i had my my girls were here this weekend so i wanted to be up in the morning for them and hang out with them a little bit before they had to leave early their mom came picked them up and uh, took them to her mom's house for mother's day to see to see the other grandma so that's been my day and it's gosh 6 34 p.m I'm gonna. I, I think I'm getting back to a normal schedule this uh, weekend. But enough of that. So, um, yeah, good timing. The intro just faded out. So, um, I, I love that intro music. I, I mentioned that the other night. It's just sort of cool, you know. Um, you can even hear the birds. The only time you really hear those is when I do a really, really late one at like five thirty in the morning when the birds are waking up. So. But yeah, um, I, I guess I was just sort of interested in like ancient uh, civilizations and, you know, I, I've had that interest, I guess, for a long time, but I, I just ran across a video of uh, of a chick that I am um, on, on YouTube and Facebook that, that's into all that, who is very, very, very fascinating. Um, her name's Jahana, J-A-H-A-N-N-A-H. Johanna James, she's a British chick. I'll, I'll bring her up here in a minute, but um, I'm just going to going into my live cast here. Okay, there's nobody in here anyway in the live chat. So if anybody pops in, then I guess there's a window where I can see you, but I don't know how to do all this stuff. Okay, there's a chat window. I don't know if it works or not. Let me let me type a test message. Test. Okay, yeah, I see it on uh, on my phone. I guess I can respond to myself. Test. Yep, and there it is back. Okay. But yeah, she, she just, um, I mean, a lot of you have heard about, like, ancient civilizations. It's been a popular topic in uh, pop culture and Netflix uh, with the recent Graham Hancock uh, uh, ancient apocalypse series. It was like an eight-part Netflix series that talked about ancient civilizations from like Greek to like Southeast Asia to, you know, South America, like pre-Columbian, um, the Pacific cultures, the, uh, early Polynesians, um, and Australians, the Aboriginal people, you know, all the people, you know, it, it's in, in the video is going to get into a lot of this. I'm probably just going to let it play. And then if I hear something interesting, I want to comment on, I'll, uh, pop in and do that so let me go <clears throat> go over to the browser here and 
I'll go ahead and start playing it here. It's just, it's, it's about 15 minutes. I probably won't do the whole thing, but like I said, I'll, I'll pop in here whenever I, you know, get something, you know, get to an interesting point that I want to, to opine on. So here we go. So history has taught us that human beings have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, yet they didn't seem to do anything apart from be hunter-gatherers for all of those hundreds of thousands of years, and they only started to make civilization when we could find evidence for it around 8,000 BC, 7,000, but really cities started around 6,000 BC. And before then there was absolutely nothing. Nothing could have existed because hunter-gatherers did not have the technology or the knowledge or the wisdom to be able to make things like agriculture, farming, cities, kings and all of that. However, the academic timeline is starting to get a couple of major holes in it. Major hole number one. Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe was discovered in the 90s just by a farmer. He noticed that uh, this piece of rock was just sticking out the ground and when they dug down they realised yeah, again, she, she just sort of has a way of explaining things. Even though she talks fast and everything, the way she explains things is just very easily understandable by the masses, and that's why I like her. And that's I, I actually shared this video on my Facebook, uh, you know, before I did this video. And I'll probably... I need to start sharing it to all my social medias, to my Twitter. Um, and, uh, I, well, I guess this video, when I do either a live or a... Uh, or a uh, post, or just a normal re pre-recorded, it goes to Rumble. So I'm, uh, yeah, I guess on YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter, and Facebook. I don't, I don't do, I don't have a profile for DC Entropy. And somebody is deciding to weed whack or something. Yeah, it's nice. So let me go back into her video. Let, but hopefully the weed whacker will die down. Oh, it's actually like a megalithic temple, a very, very old megalithic temple. And they've only excavated about 10% of it so far there. So there's still so much under there that ha could literally be like the key to human history, but they don't have the funding to excavate the whole thing right now, which I'm like, <laughs> uh, Elon Musk. You can't carbon date stone. It's, it's like impossible. You can only carbon date organic matter. However, Gobekli Tepe was deliberately covered up they could actually date when the soil was squished on all around this area. So they could date the soil that the stones were on. That makes sense. And when they carbon dated it, they found out that this structure was buried 9,600 BC. It's like 11,000 years ago, this thing was covered. It could have been built thousands of years before that. It was just covered 9,600 BC, which literally outdates. It's like twice as old as Stonehenge. That's how crazy. And not only is it twice as old as Stonehenge, it's also way more high tech. The stones are heavier, they're taller, they're covered in ornately carved images of animals, constellations, humans, there's statues. This all existed thousands of years before the academics said that civilizations did. And the academics will say, oh, well, the hunter-gatherers made it. Well, if they made this huge, huge megalithic temple structure, how did they have the time? If you are a hunter-gatherer, all of your time has to go on catching your dinner. Yeah, like, like she's saying back then, you know, like, I guess that weed whacker's still gone. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me, let me turn down. Well, that's, I guess this is a challenge here. Let me, let me mute my phone. So I got the phone going in the background. Got the weed whacker or air, air, uh, grass blower in the background. I guess that's what it is now. So I stopped on a really bad face with her. Let me. <laughs> and making your family and. Okay, she looked a little bit better there. Okay. <laughs> I just hate when I stop on like a bad face or whatever. But um, yeah, people back then, you know, were like hunter-gatherer types. They, they didn't have time, like she's saying, to like, you know, to like learn how to build like massive megalithic monuments. They they pretty much any culture, even even today, like if, if like the power went out and like civilization like collapsed, like, tomorrow and the, like the the shtf scenarios that i've talked about in previous podcasts and stuff <clears throat> your main task each day would be like catching food and getting like drinkable water 
you know, that's, that's the only thing you would spend time on is like your next meal and, and fresh water of some kind to survive, to live. Um, so imagine back then, you know, in, in that time, um, you know, where you're a very primitive, supposedly, hunter-gatherer civilization and stuff. And, you know, so where did they find the time to build massive megalithic monuments of, on the scale that they've been finding them, um, you know, back then? So let, let, let's go back. Hopefully this leaf blower will stop. hiding from like wild animals and stuff. You don't have the infrastructure. Gobekli Tepe, this temple was made by organized people. You would have to organize workers, you would have to feed them. You would have to have incredibly skilled people that would have to spend time away from hunter gathering and spend a lifetime learning constellations and learning about ley lines and learning how to carve a correct cheetah I don't know if there's a cheetah. The whole thing just screams that we've got something wrong in the timeline and that we all need to go back to the drawing board and rethink human history. That's exactly what it is. You know, we have to go back <clears throat> to, you know, and, 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 you know, pretty much human history as we know it today. Um, it, it's sort of based upon like a religious history. Um, you know, not just Christianity, but all the different, you know, world religions and stuff. Everything's sort of based on a timeline of religious um, milestones. Um, like, for an example, like Christianity, not, not all Christianity, but some, they, you know, still believe the earth is only 6,000 years old or whatever, <clears throat> which is just, you know, silly because, I mean, <laughs> half the, the normal civilization she's talking about, the Sumerians and um, and especially Gobukli Tepe and the ancestors, to, to, excuse me, to the Egyptians go back even further than 6,000 years. So that's just right out. I'm just dismissing that completely. I think the whole 6,000 year thing is just sort of an easy, simplified way for people to understand like, like a, a historical timeline again based on religious doctrine, um, which is just, you know, Again, sort of a silly way to do it because, you know, most people would believe, you know, the Bible is, especially in the early books in the Old Testament, were mostly figurative, allegorical type stories that weren't meant to be taken literally. It's just a lot of lessons. Now, there were real people and probably real events mentioned, but but most of the, the timeline was allegorical, especially, especially going back into the first couple books. You know, I mean, actually, the first six books, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, are were written by or inspired by the journey of Noah, <clears throat> who was put in the river. I wrote an article on one of my old blogs about that. He was put into a river, and the daughter of, like, a pharaoh found him and rescued him, and he became, even though he was not Egyptian, he was... Uh, still of a high class within Egyptian society. He, he went to the best Egyptian schools, uh, ancient knowledge, I, I guess the ancient mystery schools, ancient knowledge, and had access to a lot of the, the ancient Egyptian history, which, mo again, most Christians don't subscribe to, but that's what a lot of the early, the, the books that he maybe not directly wrote but inspired were probably based on the knowledge that he conveyed from his upbringing, he grew up into adulthood in Egypt. So, <clears throat> yeah. So let's uh, let's continue. I don't want to talk too long. I want to like try to get through the video, then see where it goes from there. So let's move on. Recently, as in in the last few years, they made a discovery that literally pushed back the beginning of Homo sapiens arriving on this planet by one hundred thousand years. They've pushed it back so that we arrived in our physical form, DNA all the same, Homo sapiens arrived over 300,000 years. So previously they thought it was 200,000 years and in one discovery it jumped to 300,000 years. We just gained 100,000 years of human history and you're still telling me that these people did nothing until 6,000 BC? It just doesn't fly with me, Susan. I just feel 
like we're missing something and we're not we're not keeping our minds open to the possibility that there might have been loads of cycles of civilizations coming and going over hundreds of thousands of years and who's to say that we are not the fourth fifth 39th cycle of human civilization and that's another really interesting concept that uh that i've i've thought about on my own but uh and a few other people have mentioned a couple potential cycles but like she said we could be the first third 39th you know episode of of civilized you know culture um my dad told me you know when i was younger he mentioned a sort of a sci-fi book um it was called the mechanical for Leibowitz that uh, was written i think it was in 19 i want to say in like 1967 by an author who I think was the only book that he ever wrote. I, I, I don't know. I, I forget his background. I, I should probably look it up, but maybe I will later. <clears throat> but it was the only book that he ever wrote, and it was sort of groundbreaking in that in the book, it the it, it, the time period was like 500 years in the future from modern day, from the late 1900s when the book was written. So it was probably in like you know, 2,400, 2,500. And society had broken down. I, I think they called it the fire deluge. Um, just like the great flood was like the water deluge. Um, and, but, you know, being fire, that was, you know, they, again, it was 500 years in the future. Society had collapsed. They didn't understand what the fire was. Fire was nuclear war. And there was a nuclear war. And probably in the, you know, again, this was written during sort of the Cold War, so it was probably sort of, you know, projecting, you know, from that point. But, you know, that a nuclear war had happened, society had fallen. And then the, in the book, the only people that were left was like the, the, the church, you know, like the Catholic church. They spoke Latin and they had monasteries again. The monasteries, you know, tended to do well because they came together, you know, as a, as a group and gathered food and water and and but part of their mission too was to get to to find ancient knowledge ancient from that time and the future ancient knowledge was stuff from today so the main guy forget i forget his name uh the the monk but uh he found a grocery list i think it was from a guy and then the name on it was Leibowitz. so that's where the name of the book comes from a mechanical for Leibowitz. <clears throat> and uh but it was just a grocery list that his wife had like written down for him and you know, like wrote his name on or he wrote his name on or something. And But they also, in the in the book, they, they found like circuit diagrams from like electronic books and stuff. And that became sort of like their gospel, the religious that they worshiped. Those were holy documents. So when, when and that goes to what she's saying the cyclic nature of human history you know how you know societies advance civilizations come and go and then they build back up and they get taught by you know, somebody from the past it's a long story you got to go into it yourself or whatever but super fascinating canical for Leibowitz I'll, I'll look it up here and like while she's talking let's go back to her where's my browser okay who's to say that well, a lot of people, actually. <laughs> okay, for anyone's like, oh, we couldn't possibly be older than this because, you know, like, where's the evidence? Where's where's the evidence of stuff? I don't think people are understanding quite how long, like, 12,000 years are. If you put a Tesla car just out in the world um, and you, it would be completely gone within 12,000 years. Completely gone. Um, same with a lot of structures. There is so, buildings would be, would collapse and go 12,000 years, 20,000 years. In, in the last few years, Google Earth, uh, drones, satellites, we are able to look at the world from a very different place than we were 20, 10, 20 years ago. We're starting to be able to get really good information and a lot more scientific data. We can measure things now with late. Before I get too far from the canical there, I, as you saw, I looked it up, so. A Canticle for Leibowitz is a post-apocalyptic social science fiction novel by American writer Walter M. Miller, first published in 1959, so I was off there, set in a Catholic monastery in the desert of the southwestern United States after a devastating nuclear war. The book spans thousands of years as civilization rebuilds itself. 
monks of the Albertian order of Leibowitz, <laughs> again, named after the guy whose name was found on a grocery list, um, preserved the surviving remnants of man's scientific knowledge until the world is again ready for it. The novel is a fix-up of three short stories Miller published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction that were inspired by the author's participation in the bombing of the monastery of uh, the Battle of Monte Cassino during World War II. The book is considered one of the classics of science fiction and has never been out of print, appealing to the mainstream and genre clinics and re- or critics and readers alike. It won the 1961 Hugo Award for Best Science Fiction Novel and the themes of religion, recurrence, and church versus state have generated a significant body of scholarly research. A sequel, St. Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman, was published posthumously in 1997. I did not know about the sequel, so that's one that I'm going to have to buy. But yeah, you can look up the Walter M. Miller guy. Maybe it's not the only, obviously, maybe not the only book he ever wrote, but maybe that was just something somebody told me, but... But, uh, like I said, I believe he committed suicide. And, you know, maybe just the weight of all this knowledge and people not listening to him or doubting, you know, the possibilities that he was trying to present. So, but, yeah, leave that at that. Let's go back to uh, Johanna here. Trying to get used to <laughs> the board again. So, here we go. Lasers, laser precision, LIDAR technology. And when we're going back to these ancient sites and people are scanning the, the measurements of these ancient prehistoric megalithic structures. Personally, from what I've seen when I went to Saqqara going into the Serapium, again, there are big questions in the world that need to be answered and they don't fit within the timeline of human history. Uh, in Saqqara, they found thousands and thousands of stone made pottery no not pottery it's exactly not pottery stone made vases and dishes that literally we have no idea with modern technology how they did it the schist disc um the the vases they're full in the cairo museum they are full of them everywhere and when you speak to somebody who is a stonemason or somebody who works uh in this field they, their minds are blown because they can't understand how a civilization who could only have copper chisels, and that's all we have in the historical record, all we have been able to find in history is copper chisels for that time period. And that does not scientifically 100%, this has been verified, it is not possible to make these artifacts from the tools that we have found in the historical record. It's Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually uh, interesting that she mentions that it's not possible that they built <clears throat> those things using the, these very primitive copper chisels or whatever that they found back then because I was actually talking to a friend of mine. I'm you know, not going to mention any name or anything, but he, he uh, works with granite. Um, and I uh, w- one day, I think it was probably after I watched one of these ancient civilization videos and stuff, I asked him, like, what do you do, you know, with all your scrap granite, like after you you cut it, you know, into like a kitchen counter or, you know, a shower, shower tiles or whatever that you put up or whatever, you know, what do you do with like the bulk of the, uh, the scrap granite? And he's like, there's not a whole lot you can do with it because it's cut into pieces that are, you know, sort of, uh, you know, small and hard to work with or whatever. But then you see these ancient things. I know these are big, you know, some of them are like sarcophagi and, um, Stuff like that, but as this goes on here a little bit... Not possible. There is a huge gap in human history where we have objects, structures that just do not make sense. Yeah, some of them are larger objects and structures <clears throat> made out of granite and different limestones and and stuff, but uh, but there's also smaller objects. Like, I, I think she shows here in a minute, there's like a... Like a, a like a plate, you know. Back then, they had like bowls and they had like vases and and pots and stuff to put water and drinks in or whatever. But you know, some of this was so advanced that it was actually in the form of a plate. It looks like a kitchen plate that they ate on, but it was like made out of granite. And then there was something called the schist schist s c h i s t schist disc, which nobody knows exactly what it is. Uh, some people think that thinks it has to do with you you spin it because it has like a hole in it and these funky little 
fins on it or whatever. Some people think you spin it, it like creates like a um, like a sound, like a resonant frequency that does something. So I th I think she shows that here in a second. To the timeline, the way that we have it. And we need to be working out how they did it. How did they do it? Or let, let's step back and like just brainstorm this for a minute because it does not make sense. In the same way that we have a problem with a lot of the artifacts and how they were made, it's the same with a lot of structures. When you look back at the oldest stuff in the world, the oldest, oldest structures, the oldest statues and temples and buildings, they are the heaviest. The Listen to this part closely the most precisely cut and then as time kind of progresses we don't get better at building things bigger we we build them worse and we build them smaller which i don't think people know and i think if people knew that riddle me this why do the oldest structures in the world of ancient history why are they the most precise and the most well made and why do they get worse that is sort of the ultimate question um I mean, and again, she'll probably get into more specific examples here in a moment, but that, but that, that sentiment, that, that concept crosses all cultures. You know, why did they get worse over time? Um, you know, if you go back to the oldest periods of Egypt, you know, the, again, the talking about granite, large granite structures, you know, they carved like precision, like faces and statues of, the pharaohs and the early kings, you know, I think she talks about the king's list. And so they carve them in like intricate detail, but out of like granite, which is like one of the hardest stones. Like, I think you have granite and there's probably a few other exotic things. And there's like diorite, which is like, I think the second hardest uh, stone and then diamond. So granite I, is like probably in the, of common uh, stone is probably like number three. I'll have to like confirm that. And then it goes down like marble and, you know, different things from there. But, uh, but the, the further you go back, the bigger, the heavier, the more intricate, the more extravagant, not only like statues and smaller things, but you know, the megalithic things They become, you know, like even the Roman, some of the Roman cities were built upon more ancient, larger monolithic structures that even the ancients couldn't do, the ancients as we know them, like the Romans, so, that they couldn't even do. We don't know who did. Ba Baalbek in uh, Lebanon's a good example. And uh, I think it was a thousand ton stone uh, that was left, un you know, it, it was partially cut within the quarry, in, in the quarry, but uh, I guess the site was abandoned at some point. And the stone was mostly carved, but they didn't quite detach it and lift it up into place. But um, it was a thousand ton, you know, rectangular stone. <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely insane. And there were already other ones there. And then, like I said, there was like a Roman settlement uh, built on top of that, on top of a larger, more monolithic foundation that was pre-existing before the Roman Empire was even there. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not doing her justice. She, she could say it a lot better than I can. So let's continue. Surely, if you look at anything else in the modern day, in our civilization, we start off with prototypes. Aeroplanes started off with these little rickety wooden things. And then look at the jumbo jets we have now iPhones, look at the first ever iPhone or a Blackberry. And then look at the evolution of a mobile phone or a TV or a car. Yet in the past, it went the other way. The buildings became less impressive. Uh, they didn't last as long. They could only build them out of lots of smaller bricks. Whereas the ancient, ancient prehistory people, they could lift and carve and work with stone in a way that we do not even know how they did it. I can't. Yeah, she just showed the bell back. Let me back up a little bit. Hey, let's see here. Yeah, oh, no. That's probably a little too iPhones, far. Hold look on. At the first ever iPhone or a Blackberry. And then look at the evolution of a mobile phone or a TV or a car. Yet in the past, it went the other way. The buildings became less impressive. You show about. Oop, hold on. 
are Less they didn't impressive. last as long. They could only build them out of lots of smaller bricks. Whereas the ancient, ancient prehistory people ancient, ancient prehistory people and I stopped right at the right point. That's I believe in Bell back. Bell B A A L B E K Lebanon. Um that big stone there, as you see, it's it was mostly carved out, but it wasn't detached from the bottom side of the uh, of the pit. And but you know they if if it would have been they would have basically lifted that out of there. <laughs> I mean it's absolutely huge. I mean you see the guy here in the foreground and, and the person that's closer to it, <clears throat> which is probably still you know five and a half feet tall. And you see how long that stone is up into the distance where the people in the background are. That's huge. And it's just, it goes just as deep as it does, you know, why? That may not be Baalbek. That might be like an Egyptian, uh, like an unfinished uh, obelisk. But the Baalbek stone is very much the same. They could lift and carve and work with stone in a way that we do not even know how they did it. I can't sleep at night knowing that this is a question just staring us in the face. Another massive factor is when you actually look at the native stories from the area, the native uh, traditions and oral stories in China, they date China going back further than the academic timeline gives them credit for. Same with India. The Indian records go back way further than we will give them credit for. Uh, the native oral tradition of Egypt, same thing. They have a king's list that goes back for thousands and thousands of years. Yet for some reason, we literally draw a line and we say that all the kings that were below 6,000 BC were historical and anybody on the king list above was mythological. Simply because everything has to align with that sort of religious timeline. And like I was saying earlier, the religious timeline, everything has to align with the religious timelines of all these different cultures and stuff. And if they don't, then they, like she said, they draw a line and everything, you know, above that line is, is, is just a myth, mythological, you know, I mean, most people my age, you know, you know, generation, uh, you know, you know, X and, and well, the, probably the boomers and X and maybe a little bit of the, 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 the one after that you know we were in, even in school we were taught like greek mythology and and stuff which i i always found sort of fascinating um i was actually very very good at it um back during school on that topic i mean because it was it was sort of a i guess in a way it was you know sort of fantasy there or at least they wanted like you said to believe it was myth mythological but at the same time it was very interesting and fascinating and it tied in with with the, the actual real history they were teaching but they drew the line <laughs> that, that imaginary line was it take the line away and all the myth was probably real and she's going to get more into that and if it doesn't fit, it becomes a myth of history. And if it does fit, it becomes history history. And I find that utterly ridiculous. I saw the wall. I saw the wall for myself. I saw the king's list and I couldn't believe how many kings were on it. And when you say, well, who was that one? They go, oh, that was just a myth, that one. But the one 10 below, that was a real one. The fact that every single ancient civilization in the entire world they all have the same or very similar origin stories and not one of them claims to have invented anything. Not one civilization take any claim for inventing maths, agriculture, inventing a kingship, inventing civilization. They, none of them say, oh yeah, that was us. All of them say the same thing was that they were taught it. Somebody came, <clears throat> somebody came to them, you know, somebody taught them the stuff. It's especially, especially in, in, in South America, Central America. You know, there were historical, um, I guess, texts found about a, and it, and it goes, again, I'm, I'm, I go off in tangents. I do that a lot, so I apologize. But if you've seen the movie, it came back, it came out back, I think in the 20, either the early 20 teens or the late 00s um, called 10,000 BC. 
where, you know, in the movie, it was just sort of a bunch of disparate tribes of people, you know, like in probably it's like Southern Europe and Northern Africa and stuff. And they ended up meeting up and they formed an alliance to go against like a, like a kingdom of more advanced people who were enslaving random, you know, tribes to build the pyramids. <laughs> I mean, it's totally fictional. I mean, there's probably some grade of truth and some of it's probably based on these, these type of stories, but, um, but it was fascinating because, uh, they, I don't know if they directly said it, the movie, but they were sort of alluding that, excuse me, I've been, I've had a few beers here, but, um, they sort of alluded that the, people who were in control, the elites in that movie were, were Atlanteans. You know, they were like the remnants of Atlantis. You know, Atlantis had already fallen, but the, um, the ones that were left, you know, they, they were advanced and powerful and they were thought of as gods. Um, and, you know, you need to watch the movie if you, you know, if you want sort of a, fantasy story that touches on these things 10,000 BC the movie is really really good um in 10,000 I don't know she's she probably talked a little bit about it already but 10,000 BC if you add on the 2,000 years AD that's about 12,000 years ago that goes back to about the time of what they call the younger dryas where there was younger dryas period where it was a common impact um and like northern north america up in the like northern canada that caused the glaciers to melt the melt water you know from from that impact fed back into the atlantic ocean which if there was a, an island of atlantis or you know somewhere along you know either the coast of like north america or the bahamas off the coast of africa up around you know the strait of gibraltar or, or sort of southwestern Europe, uh, with the the sea level rise of the from the meltwater event, would have caused that society to be sunk. It would have sunk, you know, as the sea levels rose. <laughs> so, and it would have happened relatively quickly with that kind of impact. And it wasn't just one impact; it was supposedly numerous impacts that during the Younger Dryas that. Uh, Calls the meltwater event. Uh, so yeah, super fascinating. So even the movie, like I said, ten thousand plus the two hundred, it's about twelve thousand. It's like eleven thousand six hundred to twelve thousand eight hundred, whatever years ago. Graham Hancock talks a lot about it, and so does Randall Carlson on like the Joe Rogan podcast and the Ancient Apocalypse series on Netflix that I mentioned earlier. So let's continue and finish this off here. By someone else all of them and we don't we don't think anything of that i find that really weird um some cultures say they were taught by visitors some say they were taught by the gods that visited some people talk about the big people the the nephilim the wise ones the seven sages they all have different names but it's the same story worldwide that they were just living their worlds they were being hunter gatherers and then people arrived visitors arrived and they taught them how to do this stuff and it kind of makes sense. This is what I think the timeline of human history was. I think it just doesn't kind of make sense. It completely makes sense. Uh, <laughs> like I mentioned, the South Americans, the Egyptians, like even the even the word like Sumer, Sumeria, the Sumerians, even the word Sumer, literally translated as land of the civilized lords. So they named their land after the civilized lords, which if you go back to what she was saying about like the king list, you know, the ones where they draw the line, the civilized lords were probably the mythological, that ones that were declared mythological above that certain cutoff point. But uh, the Egyptians, they have their sort of prehistory, their, their ancestor, you know, where they came from as do most North American tribes, South American, Central American, African, um, Southeast Asian, Aboriginal, it's a, uh, a Polynesian, uh, you know, the New Zealand, uh, 
Aboriginal, I forget, what, what are they called? The, uh, the dude, the Hakas, the uh, rugby team, <laughs> the All Blacks in New Zealand. Uh, so they, you know, they, the, the Maori, the Maori people. So um, the Polynesian Maori, they're sort of connected, you know, way back. I, I think the Maori are sort of a connection between like the Australian you know, aboriginals who made their way to New Zealand and then, you know, the, then they sort of over time became the Polynesians that made their way through all the South Pacific islands, Fiji and all the different, you know, Vanuatu and tu, Tuva and, you know, all those different, you know, South Pacific islands all the way up to Hawaii and Easter Island and all those places. So history is... <laughs> Is, is full of unwritten history that was, you know, passed down through oral legends that uh, if, you, if you visit any of these places, you'll find it. I mean, you'll find the, 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 the history and the stories that, that the people have dictated from their ancestors, but it's not really openly accepted within mainstream history and archaeology and, and uh, anthropology and, you know, in, in those fields and in, in the mainstream fields. And that, that's the maddening part about it is that, uh, you know, that the, there's so many stories that <laughs> are out there. And, and even here in like North America, the Shawnee Indians in like Ohio and uh, modern day Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, there were places that, um, like for example, Fort Ancient in Ohio off of I-71 when you head out of Cincinnati. Fort Ancient is, it's called a fort because it, it was a, a stone fort, but it was, it was built before, you know, the Shawnee Indians and the other Indians in that area were even well formed and established. Even they say in their legends that this was here before we were, you know, we didn't build these structures. We lived within them, but they were here before we were. Just like I was talking about in, in, in the Middle East, you know, how the Romans built upon the previous structures of, a, of the previous civilizations, whoever they were. Um, this similar thing happened here in North America. Serpent Mound in Ohio. Graham Hancock talks about that in the ancient apocalypse. That goes back to about the same time as you know, Gobuki Tepe, you know, the 11,000... 600 to, you know, 12,800 years ago, the younger dry ass and the meltwater, you know, the, so the, even Fort Ancient, the snake thing, it's like a snake mound, it, it's a serpent mound, so it's like a snake mound, and then the snake's mouth is like, you know, sort of like eating an egg. You can Google it and look it up. A lot of people in this area are in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, they know about it. It's sort of right there in the tri-state area outside of Cincinnati, so... But all the stories, when you connect the dots, they, they all have a similar, similar uh, origin story. I think that throughout the hundreds of thousands of years of human history, we have always risen to that point where we have made civilizations and we've made cultures. And these cultures have evolved and they've grown. We live in a very cataclysmic atmosphere. We don't feel like it is because for the last 10,000 years, we've been all right. But science is starting to pull up that we live on a cataclysmic cycle, which is kind of terrifying if you think about it, because the thing about a circle is that what goes around comes around and it will happen again. So everyone knows about the dinosaurs being destroyed in the comet that hit the dinosaurs, like we all, we all know that one. But did you know that there is growing evidence that about 13,000 years ago, Earth was hit by another round of comets during the Ice Age called the Younger Dryas? That's just what I was talking about, so now she's getting into it. And this is looking like the reason why there was a huge spike in temperature around that time, as seen by the scientific graph. So these comets, or even fractured bits of comet, whacked into the Earth, completely melted instantaneously and obliterated. She says it so much better than me. It whacked into the Earth and completely obliterated. <laughs> um, I'm not nearly as articulate, so... Uh... Yeah, I'll let her keep going. She's better than me. 
the ice sheet that was covering most of North America, turned the ice into a huge cataclysmic tsunami that spread over about two thirds of the world, kind of destroying literally everything. And it might account. And if you saw in that last graph, you know, it, it was not only like Canada, North America, the meltwater down into. You know, because the glaciers reached all the way down into like Ohio, even like central and southern Ohio, like right above the uh, Serpent Mound I just mentioned. Um, you know, like ice, like a mile or two miles thick, and that melted. I mean, it, not all of it, like immediately, but you know, it melted the, as the temperatures rose and melted rapidly, geologically speaking. So, you know, over the, but the. There was a lot of melting that happened on the impact sites that would have caused, uh, you know, a sea level rise. It could have sunk Atlantis in the, on that graph, as you saw it, uh, sort of uh, goes over, it even swings out and goes over like uh, Asia, as, or uh, I'm sorry, Europe as well. So For about two thirds of the world, right kind there. of destroying literally everything. And it might account for why every single ancient civilization has a cataclysmic flood story in their origin texts. There is a thing called the Torrid Stream, and it is literally like a belt of flying asteroids and comet shrapnel. And we fly through it as a planet two times a year, every June and every November. So two times a year, we're just like cracking on with our daily life and watching Netflix, and we are literally flying through an asteroid belt of horrendously sized shrapnel of comets. And any one of them, if they hit us, we would be utterly destroyed in cataclysms worse than any disaster movie you will ever watch. And we have no idea about it. However, historically, we do. That's a disaster movie that needs to be made. Like I said, the 10,000 BC was pretty good, but it didn't get into this, you know, like so, so much. Um, like, a, like a movie, I guess you could I go, go a little further back, call it like 12,000 BC or 12,000, <laughs> whatever. Um, or just call it the Younger Dryass. Um, call it that and um, mention Atlantis, you know, do a trailer for it and hype up the uh, ancient civilization. It'll be a huge hit. I'm actually sort of with, with the advent of like Graham Hancock, um, you know, his ancient apocalypse and... Randall Carlson also being on that show as well as on Joe Rogan, uh, Robert Schock, you know, the e Egyptologists, um, Johanna James, there's another guy, I think it's Bright Insight. Uh, there's, a, there's a, if you got like all these people involved to like help do the script writing and stuff, you would have a movie of, su that, of such epic proportions. You know, everybody likes the movies that have like epic cataclysm you know like you know independence day when they're blowing up like cities and the day after um when this everything's freezing and the global warm the al gore movie or whatever and you know, all those movies uh, 2012 you know which i guess that that's based on the ancient history the 2012 <clears throat> end of the world stuff um you know that that had the epic scenes of uh destruction of the comets coming down and and hitting like out in Yellowstone and the Yellowstone Plateau blowing up and all that stuff. So they need to do one on this topic, this particular ancient topic and, and, and then to sort of tell the story and lead it up to where we are today. Do because people have tried to warn us. And the reason why I've spoken about this in, in, in many videos, but the reason why I got hooked on this subject and the reason why I believe it is because when I look at the science of the Younger Dryas Comet impact, and I look at the dates of when that happened, the dates align perfectly with when Gobekli Tepe, remember that, beginning of the vid, the megalithic temple site in Turkey, it got deliberately buried exactly around the same time as the comet impact happened in the world. So it is... They were advanced enough, though. Whoever built Gobekli Tepe was advanced enough to know that it was coming. They, they, they could, you know, see the comet or they knew the comet was coming, whether it was a cycle <clears throat> that had happened before you know, like a previous 10 or 12,000 years before uh, the Younger Dryas and the Gobekli Tepe uh, burial, 
when before they buried the site. So they were advanced enough to know. So that says a lot. My belief that people were trying to preserve their history, they were trying to preserve their knowledge, most important information for us, and they deliberately buried the temple because they were trying to pass that knowledge on. And it was only thousands and thousands and thousands of years later that we've discovered it. And we still haven't even looked at the whole thing. When you read Plato's Atlantis, and you look at the story of that and the story of Solon, who traveled, he was a historian. He traveled to Egypt around 600 BC and he asked for the history of and the origin story of the Egyptians. And the Egyptian origin story told to them at the time by the priests of Egypt were that Egypt was a colony that survived a huge cataclysm where everybody was destroyed in a day and a night. Well, not everybody, because obviously there was a few survivors. And it happened 9,000 years ago. 9,000 years plus 600 equals 9,600 BC, the same year that Gobekli Tepe was covered up for some reason unknown, and the same year that we have the science that a comet has hit the world and caused huge cataclysms. Thank you very much. Boom, 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 boom. That is enough for me to go, okay, I do not believe the academic story timeline that I was taught in school. I'm starting to believe this new version of events that we are way older than we ever perceived we were. I'm with you there. I'm with you there, Johanna. So I believe exactly the same. We are on a cycle of civilization, not a linear line. And for me, that makes so much more sense. And all of the question marks that we have in history, how do we have these structures that we don't know how to move? How do we have these objects that we don't know how to make? Why is the oldest stuff that that was the schist disc that I was talking about. I don't know if that she showed good line. coverage of that. And for me, that makes so much more sense. And all of the question marks that we have in history, how do we have these structures? The big stone that I mentioned earlier. Which is that we don't know how to move. How do we? The schist disc, which I believe was made out of granite, but you can see how precise it is. You know, the, the like I said, the little fins. And there's like a uh, cylinder that comes up from the center of it. It's like perfectly proportioned. It's a perfect uh, disc with these fins and this, uh, you know, tube coming up that, you know, it can fit on top of something. It, it's some, it's, it's either some kind of tool or some kind of, uh, like I said, uh, acoustic resonance device. Maybe that's how they levitated stuff. Who knows? Who knows? We have these objects that we don't know how to make. Yeah, I don't know how to make. Why is the oldest stuff that we can find the most precise and the, um, the most higher tech? How does that make sense? It, it doesn't. Because it's from the cycle from before. These are remnants of a previous civilization that we have not acknowledged. Are you still with me? If you are, amazing. Um, try Share this, hopefully, share this with your friends and your family. And I did. And the people who are a bit skeptical um, of anything because they've just seen ancient aliens. Lovely, I've literally talked for like 40 minutes, so I'm going to stop. Um, thank you, thank you. I'm 40 minutes cut down to 15, and I guess my video's 53 minutes. I've been streaming for, yeah, 50, 54 minutes. Recording for the same. I wish some of my friends would've came in here. Yeah, I mean, cause they're all pretty, pretty smart people, but I guess I, I, I didn't tell them ahead of time or anything. I didn't give anybody any heads up or notice, but I posted it to my little, little uh, conspiracy group and was hoping somebody would come in. But well, um, let me, let me play my little intro. I'm just going to play this. I've got to run in the house real quick. I'm just going <clears> to <throat> let it play a little bit and see if anybody comes in. So. I'll be right back.
So, yep. My, my laptop's still doing okay. I still have some battery uh, here. 68%. I'm sort of surprised it didn't take up more battery since I was both streaming and recording at the same time into a file. So, sort of shocking, actually. I've had this MacBook for about a year or so. Well, going on two years. Maybe three. I don't know. Two, two, two and a half. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been charged up and down numerous times. And when I looked at the last battery capacity, it was like 80%. But I guess with the M1, it's such an efficient computer that uh, I think when it was brand new, it had like a battery life of just like normal like web browsing or video watching or whatever, like YouTubing of like 18 hours. So I guess even at 80%, it's still pretty, pretty good. Like 16, 15, 14 <laughs> hours, but you know, CPU is being used more at the moment. So <clears throat> I got a lot of programs open. OBS is doing its thing. The audio from the roadcasters feeding in, but how do you like my shirt? By the way, <laughs> your favorite band sucks an old shirt i've had it for about 20 plus years now it was from the uh if you if y'all remember the old the onion.com because that's about the worst thing that you can say to somebody your favorite band sucks there's not much of a greater insult than that maybe outside of like yo mama jokes or which I we shouldn't get into because it's mother's day again happy mother happy mother's day to any mothers out there if you haven't uh, told your mother that, then do it before. Uh, got four four hours and thirty two minutes left to do that, so go do it. Well, depending on what time zone you're in, I'm at Eastern Standard Time. So, <laughs> again, I wish somebody would have came in, but I guess no luck there. Maybe they're creeping in the background, and but it says only one person watching. So I'm still a small channel. I did get a new subscriber, it looks like. It was 325. I'm up to 326, so that's good. I don't know who it was. I got a shout out on the from the uh one of the guys I made a video on the other day, uh sanctioned Ivan, one of my Russian friends who went back to Russia. He was uh in Turkey for a while, like during the mobilization, but <clears throat> Once the mobilization sort of ended, he wanted to go back to Russia to see family and and everything. It's it's sort of hard to continue traveling and trying to, you know, leave your country and everything when you know, you're 24 years old. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he like lost his job because of the sanctions. He used to work like in car importa like in importing in Russia, like importing like uh, Western vehicles and stuff into uh, to, into Russia, like Fords and Chevys and stuff. He actually drives a Cadillac Escalade. I think it's a 2008 Cadillac that he really loves, and that's awesome. <laughs> it's like my American muscle car. <laughs> Love you, Ivan. I don't know if you, you, you're, I know you watch some of my videos, but I don't know if you'll make it this far in, but you're a cool dude really like you so um and as well as a number of other youtubers i follow uh that, that deal with that part of the world um bald and bankrupt is a is a popular one he, that went through a lot of controversy and ivan now is going through a lot of controversy because he decided to go back to russia and everybody's calling him like a traitor and accusing him of supporting like the putin regime and and all that stuff and a lot of people are saying I hope you get mobilized and get sent back in a black body bag and so like all kinds of nasty vicious attacks on people and that's just not right it's not acceptable you know you, just because he went back to his home country doesn't mean that uh, he supports or agrees with what they're doing in the world just like you know I may not support and agree with the, the government here in the United States and how they're handling you know politics and how you know handling things but that doesn't mean I don't love my country and that I would rather be here than anywhere else I mean I'd rather stay here and like you know fight for my beliefs and 
and stuff. And yes, I, I, I have that more, I have that freedom more so than people in Russia or people in other parts. And even the Ukraine, you know, everybody's supporting Ukraine, but Ukraine has cracked down on their own people just as much as, uh, Russia, if not more in some ways, uh, I believe the Zelensky in Ukraine, I hate to get into like politics after such a good video, but I guess it's good that I left it to the end, but, um, but Zelensky like arrested like the leaders, the leaders of the Russian Orthodox church within the Ukraine in, in those territories that, uh, that they're fighting over, you know, Donbass, Luhansk, Zaporovia. He's actually, you know, Zelensky, the Zelensky that Biden and America and the West and NATO supports, he's not only arrested, but he shelled, he shelled those areas. He's killed innocent civilians. You know, Russian, ethnic Russians that live within the Ukraine, he's killed them. And nobody, they don't talk about that in the mainstream media, but, you know, that's a getting in the, into the weeds here, but. I got a little bit into it the other night, and so I'll just leave that maybe for another another live cast or another video another time. But yeah, this ancient civilization stuff's cool again. Wish somebody would have came in, but hey, small channel. Maybe I'll pick up some uh, traffic later, but I'm going to go ahead and just stop this recording. I'm just going to let the live stream stay up and just see if I get any uh, any views on it. I don't know if I can like move the live stream over to my main feed or whatever. I guess I'll have to figure that part out, so... I guess I can't say everybody have a good night. Everybody have a good evening. And if you stay up late, have a good night and uh, peace out.